Okay, well, why don't we go ahead and get started. I know folks are still joining us, but I want to be respectful of everybody's time. Um, so, Alexa, if you would go ahead and move to the next slide. Um, we're going to get started with some introductions. So I know many of you on the on the line, but welcome to our regional Puget Sound Regional EV Collaborative Meeting. My name is Kelly McCurdy. I'm the Director of Transportation Planning here at the Puget Sound Regional Council. I also manage our air quality and climate change programs. A little bit of background. Um, our agency has been partnering with the Puget Sound Clean Air Agency since about 2019 on this regional EV collaborative. And the purpose is really to help support all of you, our local jurisdictions, as well as other stakeholders in really advancing electrification of the transportation system. And the goal of our two agencies with this effort has really been to share resources, provide best practices and technical assistance, and really foster that shared understanding and a baseline data to help accelerate this work. Uh, in general, we've been holding about two meetings a year of the regional EV collaborative to really provide a space for these conversations and the information sharing. Um, as I'm sure you all are aware, the pace of electrification has been rapidly picking up over the last few years and our two agencies really want to hear from you on what additional support that we can provide. And to help facilitate that discussion, we're going to learn this afternoon about resources that are available at both the federal and state level, and then we'll open it up for a group discussion. I'm going to walk through just a few meeting logistics, and then I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues at the Puget Sound Clean Air Agency to introduce themselves. Um, first, you probably heard me chattering a moment ago. The chat function is disabled for this meeting. Um, we I, I'll just speak for myself, find it really distracting when the chat is, is uh, in play because there's a lot of conversations, a lot of information. So it really kind of detracts from uh, the folks presenting and the conversation that we want to have. So the chat is disabled. We really do encourage though, we are going to have um, opportunities for questions and comments. So we would just ask that you raise your hand and turn your cameras on. I think we've all been doing this uh, Zoom experience experiment for a couple of years now, so you should all be aware of where the where that function is. The look for the raise hand symbol either at the top of your screen or at the bottom of your screen. And if for some reason that just isn't working for you, we can do it the old fashioned way. Turn your camera on and just wave your hand and I should be able to see you. Um, we have two speakers and if time, we will have short space for, for questions directly after, but we will definitely have time at the end of the meeting for more, uh, for more open-ended question and comments. Um, we're also gonna run through several in-room polls throughout the course of the meeting. So with that, I will call on my colleagues at the Puget Sound Clean Air Agency. So Jennifer, do you wanna start us off? Sure, hello, I'm Jennifer Keen. I am at the Puget Sound Clean Air Agency managing the Department of Clean Air and Climate Initiatives. Been with the agency for about a year now and Two of our areas of strategic focus are reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions and diesel emissions. So strong ties to this clean transportation conversation and we're always looking for opportunities to partner and do this work regionally. And I will hand it over to my colleague, Erica. Hi everyone, um, I'm Erica Walters, also with the Puget Sound Clean Air Agency. Um, I'm relatively new to the agency. I've been on for about five months now um, as an air resource associate. So largely supporting the transportation electrification initiatives. Um, I also am working on the comprehensive climate action plan that the agency is leading um, and support our grant writing support program for overburdened communities. Um, and I'll pass it over to Mary. Thanks, Erica. Hi, everyone. My name is Mary Cho, and I'm also an Air Resource Associate here at the Puget Sound Clean Air Agency. I've been with the agency for about two years, um, and I work with Jennifer on our diesel programming as well as our REV Collaborative, so it's great to have you all here. And with that, I'll pass it back to Kelly. All right, so before we uh, dive into our program, we're going to go ahead and do our first poll, so I'll ask Alexa to go ahead and pull that up. And we'll give this just a minute because we want to do want to stay on time. So this is we are looking to just get a sense of, of folks in the room and how you would describe your jurisdiction's current level of public EV charging infrastructure. Oh, great fast responses.
Okay, well, I think we're still a little bit at 26. I know that's on everybody in the room. Folks could be thinking about it, but I think that gives us a, a good sense of, of where folks are. Alexa, are they able, are folks seeing the results in real time? I'm sharing the results now. Okay, perfect. So it looks like um, the majority of folks are saying it's limited level of infrastructure right now, some with moderate and then a few with with no. We're working for that last bar of well developed. All right, thank you for participating in poll number one and I will turn it over to Mary to do introductions of our first speaker. Thank you again, Kelly. So to kick things off, I'd like to welcome our first speaker, Kaylin Bope, Transportation Project Leader at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. Kaylin, thank you again for being here to talk about the Public EV Charging Infrastructure Playbook, and the floor is all yours whenever you're ready. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mary. Um, yeah, thank you all for inviting me um, to join this meeting today. I'm going to do share some slides in a second and um, run through a new resource um, created by the Joint Office of Energy and Transportation. So let me pull those up now. Okay. And let me know, just confirm that you can see those. Great. Okay. Um, so wanted to, before I dive into the playbook, I um, want to give you a little background on the, the joint office um, so you can kind of understand the context of where this resource was created and, and some of the work that I do that ties into this. Um, so Mary mentioned I work at the National Noble Energy Laboratory, but in that role I support um, the joint office, which is um, kind of a marriage between the Department of Energy and the Department of Transportation that has a specific focus on advancing um, clean transportation and zero emission vehicles and infrastructure. Um, um, we were born out of the bipartisan infrastructure law, along with um, many of the funding programs that you see on the screen here. So um, one of our big jobs is to support um, these funding programs and opportunities. So um, helping people access those funds, but also um, deploying those projects. So um, a, a big one on the screen here is the second one down, the charging and fueling infrastructure discretionary grant program, um, which provides um, funding to deploy EV charging infrastructure in communities. So um, the playbook that I'll talk about is really in service of that um, program or any community that is you know, interested in deploying um, charging infrastructure. Um, um, in addition to the playbook we do, the Joint Office also, also creates a lot of other resources. We have webinars, reports, toolkits, help sheets, and checklists. Um, so wanted to call your attention to that. These are available on driveelectric.gov, which is the, the website for the Joint Office of Energy and Transportation. Um, and we also provide um, free, no cost technical assistance. So um, if you have any questions or looking for support on your project that you're working on, whether or not you've received funding or not, we're here to help. So you can um, contact us um, via our concierge service on our website, submit a question and we'll get a response to you right away um, with information resources, helping you do that research. Um, and can also, um, if you need more in-depth technical assistance, we can support you as well. So um, as I present later today, if um, I, I know I'm around for some Q&A, but if I can't answer your question in like, you know, 30 seconds, we can maybe reach back out and we can set up another time to talk. Um, and we provide TN a lot of different things. So workforce development, siting, stakeholder engagement, charging deployment, um, you name it. All right, so diving into the topic at hand, this um, public EV charging infrastructure playbook. There's the link there um, if you wanted to just pull that up or, or poke around yourself um, later today. Um, but I will give an overview of some slides and then I will attempt to do kind of a live demo um, on my screen and walk through some of the features so you can see that. Um, the so origins of the playbook are actually come out of a different Department of Energy program called C2C, so Clean Energy to Communities. Um, they did a cohort with about 15 communities that were all focused on planning and funding for public EV infrastructure deployment. Um, so it was a six month cohort that took place last year. And out of that, um, we developed um, these eight modules to go through that communities can work towards developing an EV readiness plan. Um, and we took that 
you know, the lessons learned from those communities in real time and put it into an online playbook for any community to access. Um, so what's great to know about the playbook is that this has been um, beta tested already, if you will, by other communities that have gone through this cohort and use these tools. Um, so, and you'll see a lot of that insights in the playbook when we get to it. Um, and, and the cohort covered many topics and was also supported by Clean Cities and Communities, which is a, a network out of the Department of Energy. Um, so high level overview on the playbook. This is an interactive web-based resource to help communities plan and build a public EV charging. There are eight modules um, and each module um, has similar type components to it, um, activities, videos, um, and a library of resources relevant to that topic. Um, and this is, you know, available to and useful for any community, whether you're um, a city, a county, um, could be, um, you know, or, or a regional jurisdiction as well. Um, and the modules are meant to be kind of plug and play. So you, you can go in any order that you would like. Um, um, the slide always gets messed up. Sorry about the T on the engagement and the procurement one, but um, these are the modules um, that you will go through the eight modules. So um, these are self-paced. Again, you can jump into any section that applies or is of interest to you. Um, and these like modules really draw from an extensive world of resources created by the Joint Office, Department of Transportation, Department of Energy, the National Labs, um, and many other organizations. I'm sure you guys have, um, it sounds like this group has done some research and uh, work already in this space. And you'll know that there are a lot of excellent um, groups and organizations out there um, working to support communities like you on this. So our goal here is to scaffold all those resources and that information into um, this format with modules. Um, so it's a little less overwhelming, a little more structured to it, and you can tap into those along the way. So we're really trying to build on um, all the information that's already out there and make that um, useful and a little more digestive. Um, to communities. Um, and another thing I'll point out is that each module has one to four activities to complete or uh, you know, optional to complete, three to four videos from either real communities discussing examples of their work at this phase in the um, readiness planning process or subject matter experts providing um, kind of a topical and technical presentation that's relevant to it. Um, and the videos are I think five to 20 minutes long, give or take. Um, and each module also has a searchable library of related vetted resources that are relevant to the content in there. So I think my next slide has an example of module one here. So module one is developing an EV infrastructure plan. Um, so you can see these example activities, um, videos from real communities across the US um, and some additional resources. Um, so in this one, there's a list of downloadable list of um, links to real EV infrastructure plans that other communities have. So you can go find those elsewhere. You don't have to um, do that research on your own, um, as well as other um, tools and resources that you can click through. Um, so some examples of module activities. Um, Every module has uh, guiding questions to get you started. In some modules, that's the only activity. Um, and I like to think of the guiding questions as here's a list of things that you know you may be considering at this level and it's worth talking through. So um, when I've talked to some communities, I'm like, this is a good list to go through and kind of cross out the ones you've already addressed at this stage. <laughs> you know, highlight the ones that you need to talk about or look into a little bit more and, and go from there. Um, and those guiding questions also point to um, I guess also sometimes external resources that might be helpful in those conversations. So um, for here in module four, um, guiding questions include things like, um, you know, what type of charging equipment are you looking into? You know, level two versus DC fast charging. Um, are there any key deadlines coming up that you need to um, clue into your timeline or cost share requirements related to your funding opportunity? Um, just laying the landscape for that phase of planning. Um, here's, you know, some of the videos that each of the module have, and you can see a diversity of, of speakers and presenters here on topics. Um, and these are linked in the each module. 
And then lastly, there's um, a resource library in each module that you can sort through based on these tags. So um, this is just an example from module three, but you can see you can hone in on resources related to equity or curbside charging or workplace charging. Um, the tags are different for each module depending on um, which module it is, but um, we've tried to do the resource the research for you and vetting some really great resources, um, both at you know federally created and, and externally created, um, that could be helpful. Um, okay, so I ran through that quickly, and then um, this is always a little terrifying. I'm gonna stop sharing the screen and pull up um, my browser and do a, a walkthrough of that. So give me just a minute while I do that. So that's. Let me reshare with this new screen here. Okay, and let me know if you guys can see that should just be the home page of the playbook. Yep, okay, great. Um, so here's the Here's the, hype, the link again if you wanted to, to come to the joint office. It's linked right from the, the homepage here. Um, and here on the order, um, oh, and I just got a pop up saying Zoom. Am I still here? Can you guys still hear and see me? Okay, cool. I'll keep going. We'll pretend that didn't happen. <laughs> um, introduction and then yeah we come to module one so you can click on them at the top to navigate or scroll down through them um and in each of them you can click on these gray bars here for each of those components of the module so you have activities videos and additional resources um, and you also have the ability to provide feedback on each of the modules or the playbook. So if something's particularly helpful or not helpful, or um, there's something you'd like to see, would love um, for you guys to submit that feedback to us. Um, so I'm just gonna kind of walk through each of the modules in a little more detail and give some ex community specific examples of um, how that module can be used, um, if that works for you guys. And um, I guess I'll ask, um, you know, Mary and her team to chime in and cut me off if I go too long. I know I can be kind of a lengthy talker. So I'll get through as many as I can um, while, and try to keep an eye on the clock. So um, it sounds like you guys as a, as a region and some of the communities have already done some, some EV readiness planning, um, but I do encourage you to check out module one and for example, download some of these guiding questions um, or look into how to conduct a baseline assessment if you haven't done that already, because that can be a really great way to kind of ground the work you're doing for, for readiness planning, um, even if you've maybe done some work already, but worth looking into, excuse me. Um, I think one example here that I'd like to point out with module one is in the video section, um, we had Brian um, uh, Booher from Charge Montgomery out in Montgomery County, Maryland, um, participated in the cohort and his community developed a community EV charging infrastructure plan. And he, in this video, does a really great job of talking through how to conduct a baseline assessment for the community. So this includes, you know, pulling how many EVs are registered in your area, understanding um, projections for EV growth, and there's some really great federal tools to help you pull those projections together. Um, and then on the flip side, understanding, you know, baseline conditions for what's charging in your region, also understanding any charging that's planned for your region, but maybe not installed yet. So for example, if any charging is coming down the line from, um, the National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Program or other, other funding programs. And then also projecting how much charging you'll need 10, 20, uh, 25 years out based on the projected growth in EV demand. So I think um, it's easy to jump into, oh, it'd be great to put you know, a charger here at the library or at the school or whatever. But I think it's good to you know, really zoom out and look holistically at what is our charging um, need and you know, what, what numbers are we trying to get to and what would, how would they best be met, whether that's home charging. Um, and that could be dependent on your housing stock in your community, whether you have a lot of multifamily housing or single family homes. Um, 
and then going from there to understand your needs and, and projecting those. So that's kind of the purpose of a baseline assessment. And this video by Brian is a really excellent demonstration of them walking through that process out in um, Montgomery County. So module two, this is a module focused on um, engagement and provides resources on how to effectively engage with community members and stakeholders around EV infrastructure planning in your community. So one of the resources or activities here um, is creating a stakeholder map. Um, this is actually a downloadable spreadsheet um, and it helps you identify stakeholders. And there's also a list of engagement activities that you can pull from to, to conduct engagement. Um, so one example here is um, Western Riverside County uh, Clean Cities, which is a Clean Cities coalition based in, I believe, a council of governments, uh, a council of government out there. Um, they did a community transportation needs assessment that was heavily based on stakeholder engagement. Um, and they used that engagement to direct what funding they inevitably um, decided to go after and how to draft those um, grant proposals um, and inevitably implement those projects based on really what the community wanted. So they did this back in 2020 and there is a video on this um, in, the, in the module here. So that's Taylor York presenting. Um, so that's a good one to kind of look into on what they did locally and how they not just did engagement but actually used that engagement for something kind of meaningful and actionable and provided that feedback loop to communities on, hey, we heard you and here's what we're doing with it. Um, module three, um, this one is deployment strategies and site identification. Um, so this module provides resources to guide the determination of how and where to deploy EV charging infrastructure. And these resources can be used to develop strategies for EV infrastructure build out, um, both on public and private property. Um, so a big activity here um, that I'd like to point out, again, besides the guiding questions, is um, a siting assessment worksheet. And there's two options here you can do with that worksheet. So one's a process for identifying sites for public facing EV charging infrastructure at municipal facilities. And the other is a process for identifying sites for charging at private facilities. Um, so there's really specific instructions on how to do both exercises, kind of depending which way you're going. There's some big differences there. Um, and there's also some, um, I guess steps in there that include how to identify existing stations using um, the alternative fuels data center and how to overlay um, existing charging infrastructure with a map of um, identified disadvantaged communities based on what metrics you can you can select from. So it's kind of a mapping exercise. Um, and I know some, some folks have an awesome GIS team, which is great. And other people maybe mapping can be a little intimidating, but this is pretty accessible um, really for anyone to do. So that's module three. Um, module four is a focus on costs and funding. So these are resources and activities to help determine what the costs of proposed EV charging infrastructure are and how to identify funding sources. Um, a really great example here is um, oh, under videos. Uh, I think it's Alicia Cox out in Wyoming kind of Jackson Hole area, talks through how she puts together a grant proposal, um, which is really helpful just to hear from someone else doing it. I know um, sometimes I feel like I, I, I'm, you know, quasi federal employee and there's like, it's hard for me to give people guidance on how to apply for funds because that's not sometimes my place, but it's nice to hear from a peer on how to, how to go after that, how to put together that proposal, what to highlight. Um, so that's a good um, video to watch and, and um, learn from. Um, and I'll point out that there's some really great resources in this section um, that can help identify funding opportunities, including not just grants, but you know federal tax credits um, and other incentive programs as well. Oops, that's kind of, okay. Module five, uh, policies and incentives. So um, here we're looking at how state and local governments can facilitate adoption of EV friendly regulations to streamline um, the approval process and deployment of charging projects. So this includes things like um, zoning or parking minimums, um, uh, building codes, things like that. Um, one of the activities is a contextual policy scan. So how to understand 
but applies to your region at a federal level, a state level, um, regional or, or local level and kind of piece that together, all those layers to know kind of where, where you're currently standing at and what direction or tools you have to go forward. Um, on the resources side, I just wanna point out a couple examples here. So let's say you're, you're new to EV charging and EV policies. Um, the Transportation Energy Institute, this one here has a really great best practices guide for regulations um, describing kind of that whole landscape from federal to the local level and understanding you know, your jurisdiction um, kind of responsibilities there or what authority you would have. Um, if you're interested in changing your zoning or parking regulations, you can read about a great example from the New Jersey Department of Community Affairs. Um, they did that in their communities. You can see kind of what their approach was and what best practices they would recommend. Um, another um, kind of interpretation of policy is, you know, developing your own incentives in your community. Um, it's not necessarily something you need a ton of funding to do, but can be a great way um, if you if you have the funding to uh, stir up interest in that. So here's an example from Door County um, out of Wisconsin on that. Um, and then lastly, this is one people don't think about a lot, but um, in Colorado, there's, a, I think at the state DOT, a lot of employees have state owned vehicles that they take home with them. So if you have an employers with employer owned vehicles that employees use, what are policies that can help facilitate home charging for those employees that take those you know, vehicles home if it were to be an electric vehicle? Um, so that's a roadblock some employers have faced, but you can read from someone else what they did to deal with that. Um, okay, three more modules. I'll try to whiz, whiz through these quickly. Um, oh, and I'm sorry, I got module. I think I got module five and six mixed up on the policies and incentives versus the zoning and building requirements. But um, module six has the zoning and permitting and codes, whereas module five is more of the um, policies and incentives. So apologize for that. So I'll move on to procurement then. Um, so module seven, procurement, ownership and operation, um, how to develop approaches. Um, to EV charging infrastructure ownership structures or procurement strategies. So whether your community wants to own and operate these um, or perhaps just procure them and put on city or you know, a local jurisdiction owned property um, or incentivize them on private property. So a lot of options to consider there and those are highlighted in the guiding questions. Um, there's also a great video here. These are more in the, from the S couple more from the SME perspective, but one from World Resource Institute about different ownership approaches. Um, and we do have a local example from Ohio, um, who is one of the first states to get an RFP out for the National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Program. So they're definitely experts on navigating that federal landscape. So a good one to watch. And then rounding this out here with module eight, revenue and fee structures. Um, and this module can really help you think through important considerations related to fees and revenues, both for private and publicly owned um, EV chargers. Um, all right, so that that completes the playbook. Um, I'm not sure if any of those kind of resonated with the group or if you have questions on anything, but happy to um, uh, stick around and answer questions. And yeah, um, Mary and Jennifer and Kelly, let me know if there's anything else I can uh, focus in on more specifically. Terrific. Kaylin, th this was so incredibly useful. There's so much really valuable information and it's presented in a really user-friendly format. So, and it's very comprehensive. So thanks for that. Uh, and we do have a few minutes for questions and thanks again for sticking around because I know you I know you can't stay for the whole thing. Uh, Ross, go ahead and ask your question. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, and thanks for the presentation. Uh, Kaylin, yeah, I had a question about, so I work for King County uh, here in Washington, um, a number of us, uh, my colleagues at other counties in the region have been grappling with this and we'd like to do kind of a regional approach to this. Um, so I'm wondering if there are examples of scales that large, you know, multiple counties, adjacent counties working together. And then uh, of the modules that you've highlighted, it, it feels like uh, there would need to be a consultant to kind of lead the level of thoroughness and sophistication at that scale. Um, so is that usually the case from what you've seen for these bigger efforts uh, is consultant support used? Thanks. 
Excellent question. Thanks for raising those. Um, so I think on the um, regional approach, that's a really good um, kind of con concern or factor to raise. That's definitely different than doing it at the local level. Um, I think there's a strong tie there and, and probably something you guys already have some organizations that do regional planning, but um, I think it's still good to do some research at the local level before bringing that to the region. So making sure you have a baseline understanding of your own community, you know, what, what your needs are so that those are represented at a regional level. Um, we do have some examples in the playbook um, of that happening at the regional level. So I think one I mentioned was the uh, Western Riverside Council of Governments um, and how they did that engagement at a regional level, which is um, an impressive feat to do kind of regional engagement um, and at the planning level, there's some examples of um, EV readiness plans. So there's a list on there um, of other communities plans that have been developed and published out there. So I'd encourage you to look through that and see some different approaches that have, have happened across the US. Um, I think um, at the regional level, you really get also get into a lot more of the state context, I think. So, you know, what you're seeing in California is going to be different than Washington or New York or Oklahoma, right? So, um, you know, I trust you guys have a lot more of that state level context on what applies in your state and if there's any regulations you have to keep in mind. But, um, and then your other question was um, consultants. Yeah. Um, I'll say that, um, I think consultants are an excellent tool to use. And I think that's a really successful way to keep a project moving forward and keeping a timeline and helping carry that weight of the, the regional planning. I know that's a huge undertaking and we are all super busy and have a lot on our plates. <laughs> um, but I encourage folks that, you know, not to hand this off to a consultant and say, cool, we'll see you in, you know, nine to 12 months and let us know what you come up with. Um, so I think scoping, how you want to use a consultant is really a critical phase in the planning process on you know, where you wanna have ownership over, whether that's siting or um, certainly hopefully the engagement policy, uh, engagement process. Um, so use them as a tool, but you know, not, not a crutch, I guess is the, 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 the old advice with working with consultants, I think. All right, so I've been told that I've been sounding a little quiet because Zoom sometimes will do that. Hopefully you can hear me. If not, Jennifer, I might call on you to take over. We've got time for probably a few more questions. So David, I see your hand up. Thank you. Um, great presentation. A lot of information, mind boggling actually. Uh, and my question is, I'm just trying to figure out how much time would one be expected to go through this information um, all these modules, um, has there been like a test group or whatever? So could you tell me like, is this, you're spending three days on it or um, a week or whatever? And then also the other thing, second question is, is I'm in the planning department, but I work on sustainability and climate and, you know, part of that regional um, group that Ross um, K4C is uh, leading up. And uh, it seems like, there should be other kind of staff within our cities that are engaged in this as well. And I'm thinking transportation staff, but I'm just wondering um, if there was any thought on that, like what other staff to engage. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much my question. Uh, one other comment too. I mean, all, EV charges need to be everywhere. And quite frankly, we're just really behind. And on the east side here in Seattle, um, we got the hugest numbers of EV registrations in the state of Washington. Um, but as I talk to car dealers and talk to um, private community members and stuff, they're feeling kind of stymied. And if they don't have a home that they could have charging at, and it could be reasonably that they could, you know, get to a place to charge a vehicle, it makes sense, right? You know, it's kind of like a expanded range anxiety. So I'm just curious about that as far as a strategy, like maybe that's something like we go back and talk to with the county or whatever, but it seems like federally, this should be like, there should be a plan to just put this all in place and we help implement it. Cause that's the scale I think that we need to be operating under to really electrify our transportation. I guess that's just more of a comment. Just the first two answers would be great. 
Awesome. Thanks, David. And I, yeah. I totally agree with you on your comment. And one of the other programs I support at the joint office is the National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Plan. And, you know, a, a certain amount of funds was um, uh, obligated to all the states to create their own plan. And the first requirement is, uh, you know, DC fast charger every 50 miles along the interstate system. And then with any funds that remain, each state can come up with a plan on um, how to deploy um, those stations. So it's really, although there is, I mean, pretty strict requirements, it is fascinating to see states lean into what little flexibility that plan has to kind of, you know, make it work for their state and their needs. I mean, we're seeing really different stuff in Wyoming than we're seeing in California, you know, to kind of draw the spectrum. So um, a huge need and really different concerns across the US. So hard to do, hard to do top, top down on that. Um, Regarding your questions on planning timeline, I think, um, wow, that's a tough one to answer. And I'm gonna give like a, a, a probably a really bad non-answer to you, but I think it depends kind of where you're at in the process. I think if you're starting from scratch, I would say this is at least a six month process, you know, potentially longer um, to do it really thoroughly um, and just at a realistic pace, knowing that, you know, maybe this isn't someone's full-time, you know, 40 hour a week focus on, on doing it. Um, but if you're somewhere else in the process and maybe you're at the stage where you already have a plan in place and you're just going after funding, um, you know, your timeline might be more tied to when the next funding opportunity comes out, right? So, um, you know, the earlier you can be aware of those, the better. Um, but I've seen people pull together a really great plan and, um, you know, in 30 days because that's when the application was due. So, you know, I think use this um, playbook to your advantage on, on where you're at and what you want to do. Um, regarding the staff part of it, I mean, I was just kind of like, as you were talking, jotting down the people you'd want to get involved and it's, you know, I, I can feel almost like everyone. I mean, you'd want to talk to your zoning department and your planning team and you'd want to, you know, reach out to your fleet managers. What are they thinking for um, municipal fleet, both for, you know, private vehicles, but maybe some of those stations that could be public private, you know, if you're putting one at the library, maybe the book van can charge there, but maybe employees can charge there too. Um, certainly any sustainability staff or, um, you know, facilities management and, um, I've seen other communities really pull in their economic development team and lean into the workforce development side of things. So um, I think, you know, I am biased. I think there's a connection to every department in this city and um, maybe not everyone has time or interest in, in participating, but, you know, a great place for a working group if you could pull folks together and just keep it top of mind. Um, hope that's helpful. Kaylin, thank, thank you, you so much. Perry, I'm going to ask you to um, hold off but keep 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 tabs on your question, um, and we'll either save it till the end, or we'll send them forward it on to Kaylin. Kaylin, thank you so much for joining us. That was fantastic. Please stay as long as you can. Thank you. Um, but let's uh, uh, let's go ahead, and we're going to do our second poll, and then we're, I'll turn it back over to Mary to introduce our next speaker. All right, kind of another status question. What phase of public EV charging deployment is your jurisdiction in? And while you are answering that question, I'll just say that the, the commentary that we've heard so far, I'm sure my clean air agency colleagues are having the same thought. Uh, Wait for the Q and A because this is exactly what we're trying to figure out: is um, is there a role for a regional plan? What do you need from us? And that's really the the information we're we're hoping to gather from you today and uh, as a follow up. All right. So why don't we, Alexa? Why don't we go ahead and call it? We've got about thirty responses there. So a lot of folks in planning, but some are actually um, uh, moving forward into the the siting and looking for funding as well. All right. I think the Alexa, were the results shared? I can't quite tell from my screen. Yes, they're being shared right now. All right, perfect. All right, Mary, take it away. Thanks, Callie. So next up, I'd like to introduce our last speaker of the day, Stephen Hershkowitz, who is the Managing Director of the Clean Transportation Unit at the Washington State Department of Commerce. Steve, thanks again for being here to share your insights on the state's transportation electrification strategy, and it's all yours. Thank you, Mary uh, and Kelly and the rest of the team for uh, the intro and the opportunity to 
to share a little bit about the transportation electrification strategy that the state developed last year and is currently putting into place. Um, so my name is Stephen Hershkowitz, uh, Managing Director, Clean Transportation Unit at the Department of Commerce in our Energy Division, which is the state's energy office. Um, and, you know, just this is the really great type of work that we get to do at the state level is actually have good conversations at regional and local levels about the work that's actually happening. And I, I don't think there's any better illustration of that by just the number of names that I'm recognizing from folks who are on the call who are, are grantees um, in our charging program already. Uh, and then hopefully uh, hopefully more names that will become grantees in our uh, charging program or, or recipients of funding in the future uh, if we're lucky enough to get further appropriations from the legislature. So I'll just start out by, I'm just gonna start out by saying thank you to folks who have participated so far and all the work that goes into it. Um, the peer-to-peer -peer information exchange is always gonna be the most useful um, for everyone, but we'll do our best at the state level uh, to provide support as well. So uh, I got asked to talk about the transportation electrification strategy um, as the state planning document uh, and speak to how that might inform regional planning, the development of a regional plan uh, or other tools or resources. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, is that showing up for everyone? Yes, okay, great. All right. So uh, for folks who aren't familiar with the transportation electrification strategy, this was um, a requirement of the Interagency Electric Vehicle Coordinating Council, which is a lot of words for 10 state agencies who all have different parts to play in uh, converting vehicles to electrification. Uh, should talk to each other and come up with one plan for the state uh, and implement it. So uh, that's what we've done. Uh, the EV Council has now adopted as of February 2024 this plan that uh, includes a dense amount of uh, policy recommendations uh, that are really focused at the state level. So it's things that the governor and the legislature should be funding or passing into law. And it's stuff that agencies should be implementing through programs that they are appropriated and creating from those appropriations uh, and also regulations uh, within rulemaking authority. Uh, there are some recommendations that have different elements of utilities should do this or local governments perhaps should do this, but it's really we really tried to make it a state plan that was focused on state action and not put the burden of work on um, just from, you know, our our place in planning. Uh, that being said, we do want it to be a resource at the local level and at the regional level. And so uh, I'll share a little bit more about the modeling results now and then get into uh, some other tools and then the policy recommendations and how they influence uh, and, and fit into the playbook topics that you all just heard about. So a couple of notes on the modeling outputs, which are really now becoming targets for the state in the number of EVs that are adopted, um, and then also the number of charging ports that are needed. Um, first is these are a snapshot in time. They do detail how many ports and EVs we need to have come online each year through 2035, but they're based on assumptions that we made last year based on market conditions and our best guesses of how we should be influencing the model that we were developing with our consultant, RMI. So this year, knowing what we know now, we probably would make some different assumptions. I, I don't think they would be dramatically different. But for example, the market slowdown that happened in quarters one and two of this year in the EV market, like we didn't foresee that happening. Uh, and it more reflects some of the other um, different scenarios that are not preferred policy scenarios rather than the one that I'm going to be citing in the slides today, which is our preferred policy scenario, which is strong electrification policy. Uh, the model is very economically driven. Um, so I just want folks to keep that in mind that it's based off of a total cost of ownership um, S curve. Essentially, we assume that, you know, individual consumers are on average fairly economically driven and whether they're going to decide to purchase a vehicle. And then there's an S-curve shape that essentially, 
you know, there's less cost uh, benefits that are needed for some people and for those that are least likely to adopt an EV, the savings have to become uh, exponentially higher in order for them to convert. And this is modeled to try to reflect different cultural or um, individual behavioral, you know, preferences um, that are harder to get quantified in a model. Um, and then the, the last piece is that charging uh, is very heavily residential leaning in our model. And this is because we had a policy preference to emphasize residential charging because it's cheaper and more convenient for people and it's more affordable. It takes less funding uh, to actually build out than public fast charging does. So the more you can install access in single family homes and at multifamily residential uh, locations, whether that's in a garage, curbside, or a parking lot near the residence, the less you have to spend on very costly fast charging projects that require a lot more electrical infrastructure and are going to require a lot more energy at specific peak times. So some of the assumptions that are in the model that drive that are probably not likely to actually happen. And so I would err on the side of needing to meet or exceed the public charging targets that we have in our modeling, because, for example, we assume every single family home would have a level two 7.2 kilowatt charger at it for someone who's driving an EV. And that's that, that universal assumption is just not realistic. All right, so this is. I'm just showing this. This is one of the, the targets that you know you can use from the transportation electrification strategy for your county. Um, this is all light duty vehicles that are electrified um, in 2025, 2030, and 2035 under our maximum feasible electrification policy uh, scenario. So, you know, these numbers without context probably don't mean a whole lot. Uh, you all have probably a lot more context than I do about your county uh, that you're located in. Um, but just sharing the, this kind of data is something that we can provide at the county level. We do not have it more granular than at the county level, though, for, uh, for actual EVs. On the modeling results for charging ports, um, this is at the county level. We do have this at the census block level. I'll get into that in a second. Um, but again, just sharing that we have the data on this and you can, you know, this slide is more designed to show really the huge split between residential and non-residential because we often talk about public charging when we talk about EV charging and the reality is like the vast, vast majority of the charging that's actually happening is in the residential space, which speaks to why we prioritize that multifamily side of it so much in our charging program at Commerce. And then, like I mentioned, uh, this is a Tableau uh, dashboard that we developed with RMI um, as part of the work. Um, and so I, we can share out the link to this if having the map is helpful. I assume the actual raw data numbers would be more helpful and our team doesn't like us sharing spreadsheets through Tableau um, for data reasons that I don't fully understand, but I'm just following their rules. Um, so if you would like to see the the targets that you know for the modeling outputs at the county uh, census block level we can share those over email in a spreadsheet form there's some other uh, mapping tools that i just wanted to mention that could help inform how uh, you all want to move forward in terms of regional planning uh, so this is the mapping tool that Commerce created as part of our charging program. This was designed very specifically for uh, using scoring criteria that could be quantified to save applicants time um, from not having to write out uh, more of a narrative traditional grant application. Um, many of you are familiar with it. Uh, and so there's a bunch of different data layers here. Uh, the ones that I think are more useful um, if you're trying to like figure out good charging locations would be the trip volume metric. I will say that I would use it as one data point and not base your decisions about where to place charging infrastructure off of this mapping tools trip volume um, estimate because it's uh, one, we ran it last year and haven't updated it since. We have to keep it static for scoring purposes and consistency. Um, but also it's it's based off of synthetic data from a vendor called Replica, which also is how we came up with the modeling results. 
that I just mentioned from the TES. Um, I think they were they were reliable enough for the scoring criteria that we did, um, but we don't know how things have shifted over the last year. And there's other aspects other than trip volume that could play into future utilization. So would just advise this to be used as one data point. Uh, and then coming soon, uh, probably by the end of this calendar year, um, many of you maybe have heard that this is coming before uh, WashDOT is developing what they call a ZEV MFT or zero emission vehicle mapping and forecasting tool. Uh, this is uh, something that was passed into law for them to create a couple of years ago. And uh, you can see some of the different uh, factors that are going to be included in the map uh, on the graphic on this slide. Uh, I don't believe it will have sort of a parcel level planning uh, level, but it's I think it's just designed to bring a lot of the existing data uh, on EVs together with transportation and trip, uh, you know, uh, travel data, energy data, everything else that might be useful from like a population demographic standpoint. Um, I don't know how much of the utility information is really going to be available. Uh, it's, I don't think that there's going to be like hosting capacity information available here, but we are going to share at least some information we have on the distribution system um, from a cost assessment that we did that modeled current uh, where circuits currently are in reaching uh, their maximum capacity uh, with with uh, Washout if we can do that. All right, and then on the actual policy recommendations that I think are useful to inform the conversation here today. Uh, the first one that I wanted to talk about is uh, building technical expertise and people who are on the ground doing this work, uh, including in, in municipalities and at the county level. Uh, so one of the first recommendations in the TES is the development of a resource center um, in collaboration with WSU Energy's Green Transportation Program, which has been a technical assistant uh, for public fleets, uh, as well as um, MSRC, uh, MRSC, um, which plays an important role in helping cities across the state on a number of topics. Uh, Colorado uh, has a really good model for this, where they have uh, in their state energy office, uh, they employ six recharge coaches that help with uh, grant applications and also pro other project planning. This is similar to some of the work that we hired the Center for Sustainable Energy to do as part of our charging program and providing technical assistance. And they subcontracted with a few different uh, entities that are local to the state who helped. Um, so I know Washington Clean Cities was um, providing technical assistance for local governments in the program. And, you know, we have a, a really good uh, data point to show that this is effective by the just sheer volume of applications that we received in our first funding round of $141 million in projects. Um, at the same time, WSU Energy's green transportation team is expanding um, and uh, might be a place where the state can start to centralize its technical assistance resources that's still being figured out at the state level. We want to make electric uh, electricity capacity information uh, transparent, and this is one of the biggest challenges that we have not quite wrapped our arms around. I know one of the biggest frustrations for folks who are trying to find sites for EV charging is just, well, it would be really useful if I could figure if I could just look at a map and see, is it possible to do charging here at the power level that we want without having to go figure out who at the electric utility you're going to get in touch with. How long is it going to take to get an answer from them? What are the costs going to be? It feels like that changes every time you go back to them. Um, again, this is something that other jurisdictions across the country have have tried to deal with by requiring hosting capacity maps. Uh, I've heard mixed reviews about how effective that actually is because the data changes more often, more frequently than the required updates. Um, are to the map, uh, and ultimately you have to get in touch with someone at the utility to really verify it anyway. But uh, that is something that is recommended in the TES. Um, New York and Oregon Public Utility Commissions have uh, have example policies of this, so it's something we'll continue to assess as we talk to utilities and local planners. So one of the really 
uh, I was fun phrases of transportation electrification right now is this concept of no regrets electrical infrastructure upgrades, uh, which is where you know that a given circuit in a utility grid is going to be overloaded because it's near a port and you know you're going to have to electrify that port or it's near a bus depot, you know you're going to have to electrify that bus depot and you invest well ahead of when that depot is going to be electrified. So you don't have to say, okay, this fleet has finally decided five years down the road that they want to convert uh, sort of on a quick timeline to electric, uh, electric buses. Okay, now we have to wait 10 years for a new substation or we have to wait two years for the right transformer to come in. So that's um, something that we are going to be urging utilities to do. We're currently doing this cost assessment on uh, distribution and transmission costs related to the number of EVs estimated in the TES. Um, Seattle City Light has been on the leading edge of this and published a paper with um, the International Council for Clean Transportation, um, noting some of their system improvements they'll need. Um, I'll try to move through this quickly so we have more time for questions, but uh, just quickly, uh, one of the recommendations uh, in the TES is to develop local community partnerships. So on a larger governance level, commerce was was trying to facilitate the creation of regional partnerships. Some of those did come together. I know uh, saw Ross on the call, um, helped a lot of the, the folks with the, the K4C um, network uh, apply together. Uh, you know, there are other, so there are some other regional uh, collaborations that did happen. Um, but by and large, we saw lots of individual applicants and so there's that le layer, and then there's the other layer of actually being connected to uh, the communities that are going to be using these uh, charging uh, projects, whether it's residents in a multifamily building or it's, uh, you know, drivers who are going to be using uh, public charging infrastructure. There's lots of different ways to do this. There's no hard and fast playbook on how to do it well, um, but uh, that's something that we're interested in continuing to discuss uh, at the local level on whether there is a blueprint that we can start to create. Another thing that we've heard more on the technical side that would be helpful is developing model site designs. Um, so bringing together some of the you know more experienced technical experts at creating sort of plug and play um, model site designs that could reduce planning costs or you know engineering design costs on the front end. This is not something that we have had funding to do. Um, and haven't had the capacity to get started on to this point. But if this is something that would be especially helpful, that would be good feedback for us to have. Um, similar to that, but more on the regulatory side of things is uh, developing model ordinances and codes. Um, so this is something that California has, has done as well as Colorado, where they've developed a uh, guidebook uh, for local governments on best practices for developing both um, the you know building parking zoning side um, as well as uh, the permitting process for approving EV charging stations. Uh, so we've been consulting with a number of different stakeholders this summer, uh, including a representative from Association of Washington Cities. Um, and landed on trying to develop a guidebook that could just share best practices and resources out on model ordinances and uh, and processes to make projects happen faster. And then finally, just to summarize uh, here, uh, I put on the slide three different uses that I could see of the TES in this discussion uh, with the value and some considerations that I thought I'd throw into the mix. So the first would be sort of in developing county level or regional targets for EVs and um, charging ports. Um, obviously the value of this is making the case for funding and action from decision makers, um, which is what we use the TES for quite frequently um, and is extremely useful for that. Uh, and it also can help prevent overbuild. Like right now, we're trying to figure out what's the most strategic approach for types of charging, and we don't want to overextend in one place and leave ourselves resource scarce in something that we actually should be prioritizing. So a couple of considerations here. One is, while there are issues, I think, with the data in terms of over-relying on it at the parcel or county or you know census block level, at the county level and higher, it's pretty solid 
uh, data. And I think even if you ran a new model this year and there were some different assumptions, it wouldn't be dramatically different. So, you know, I think it might be worth just using the TES targets at the county level or regional level um, rather than paying a lot of money for a new modeling run. Uh, the other piece of this is the current risk of overbuilding in any particular area is pretty low right now because we have such a far way to go with charging infrastructure. Um, so that's something to consider in trying to whether, you know, having targets that are unique to the county or region are worth investing resources in. Second use would be informing planning tools. Um, so for me, I think, you know, when I think about this, the real value in a planning tool is like it's at the parcel level to help with site identification. That is data driven by some sort of way that you're predicting utilization because that is so important for these projects penciling out, especially for public charging, and that you're figuring out a way to incorporate um, electric power data. Um, things to consider, very costly to build and maintain. You still need to communicate with property owners and the utilities to verify the information. And then uh, the third use is just re reading it or scanning through just to build subject matter expertise and figure out what your role is at the city or county level. Um, so, you know, the TS recommendations, as I mentioned, are really intended at the state level, but they can signal where you might want to spend time learning more with other resources. And then um, just examining, like, do local governments need to be involved in site selection or should local governments be more focused on empowering communities or uh, private sector actors to lead on these projects. So talk for a while. Um, hopefully that was helpful framing. I'm happy to answer questions uh, as part of the next step. Thank you, Stephen. That was really helpful information. I do want to make sure I'm getting a little closer so you all can hear me. Um, we do want to have a broader conversation with everyone about where do we go uh, together collectively, where do we go next? So maybe if we have one or two questions specific for Stephen and on what he presented on the TES before we transition to that kind of larger next step conversation. Uh, and Perry, since I cut you off at the last time, I'll, I'll let you have the first question here. Thank you very much, Kelly. So two sessions together really are helpful because I'm really, the, when I found out about the playbook um, by Jote, it was like, so much good information in one place. And, and, and uh, uh, again, we're we're all different levels in each of those sections. So drilling down, I, I would say when the, the question was asked at the end about who needs to be at the table, and these two things will relate to the second presentation, traffic engineering and um, people involved in the accessibility rules is something I haven't heard much mention of. And um, so, we have been finding that right away is, a, is a, an important area of consideration for where um, charging should happen. And um, there's a lot of details around that relative to jurisdictional requirements. And it also has to do with traffic flow and, 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 and the management of vehicles on, on our roads. So I feel like that's a piece that hasn't been mentioned, but I specifically want to bring up the question that was a uh, presented in, in the chat, I think, or, or sent earlier to you, I think, uh, from where our ADA specialists in traffic and energy. The Air American and Disabilities Act requires EV charging be readily accessible to and usable by persons with disabilities. What strategies or tools can you provide to help us meet this federal requirement? I'll go that to Stephen. Yeah, well, we don't have any tools available right now is the short answer. Um, so this is something that is coming up in our grant program. I don't know if Perry, you were involved at all with the, uh, University of Puget Sound, uh, project that ran into this obstacle. Uh, so, you know, this is something we're looking for guidance on ourselves. I know the access board at the federal level is taking comments right now on considerations that should be folded in and they do have some. You know, so that's the resource that I can point to and I can find the link to um, their existing guidance on making accessible uh, charging uh, stations and parking lots that have charging stations in them. Uh, I think they'll be updating guidance on how to comply with ADA uh, with charging stations. But to my knowledge, there isn't a great uh, gu guidebook or you know playbook on that, but there, those resources might be available and I just don't know about them. 
I think one of the things, the key understanding is that there are things that are codes and there are things that are guidelines. And the, the access board is guidelines that have to be interpreted by the local code jurisdiction. And I think that's where the devil's in the detail so to any county trying to do a coordinated effort is getting the, the, the interpretation clear and, and delineated, which I don't think it is right now in many places. So can I, can I ask a question back, which would be, is there a state role that you or others on the call would see in providing guidance to counties on those interpretations? I've done a little bit of work with state building co council technical advisory committees, and I definitely think this is a place that, that something like that could weigh in. Uh, I remember back in 2012 around solar and roofs um, uh, access, uh, and uh, we had a great effort between different parts of the industry to really come together and define the fire code responses to solar. And ours looked different in Washington State than it did in California. So, yeah, it's, it's, I think it raises that level of a technical advisory board. All right, I want to keep us moving along. So I see two more hands. So if we could uh, keep the next few questions a little brief, and then we can transition to the larger conversation. Uh, Ross and then Kristen. Yeah, thanks, Kelly. Uh, and thanks for the shout out, Stephen. Uh, it's been an interesting path, as you know. Um, so uh, I'm interested, I spent a lot of time in the state's Tableau site, hunting around in the data. And I'm wondering, one thing that would be feels like it'd be useful to have is kind of stats of where we're at currently. I know there's, you know, these are forward looking estimates of what would be required, but, uh, and, you know, for public chargers, at least we can go to other sites and look and see what the count is, but has the state looked at any way or any kind of surrogate metric that would help estimate where we are now with how many charges are in uh, single family homes and multifamily uh, residence facilities? Um, you know, I've, I haven't been able to find anything that really that really captures that. Yeah, I'd love to have that, too. Um, so we made a recommendation in the test to create a comprehensive inventory of current chargers uh, that has met quite a bit of resistance from the charging industry. Uh, around data privacy and you know costs for reporting that are I think I think the concerns have a lot of merit to them. Uh, I've started some initial conversations with like folks at LNI uh, labor and industries and just uh, some of the inspectors that I know there about whether permits could be a way that we could try to aggregate this data from there. Uh, currently the way electrical permits uh, are categorized at least by LNI uh, there's not like a checkbox where they check it and you know because it has EV charging and if I feel a little bit weird about it, like making the request that they do that for this because then it might create like a cascade where a bunch of different electrical equipment gets added to some long laundry lists. Um, I'm open to ideas on whether there's a way to model this in some fashion. Um, I think that's probably going to be the most straightforward way to do it is to essentially uh, yeah model it. Okay, Kristen, I'll give you the last question for Stephen, and then we'll uh, move on to the, the broader group. Yeah, hi, Stephen. Uh, I'm Kristen with the City of Tacoma. I work with Perry and others, and I, I guess I, I want to highlight the part around ADA. It's, it's not just a more guidance around it, but it's the costs. So a lot of these grants don't pay for that kind of work, and our last three projects in Tacoma have had significant in the twenty to eighty thousand dollars needed for ADA improvements at those sites that were were not necessarily budgeted for. So it doesn't feel like it's maybe being um, interpreted across the states, but then just the funding. Um, and one other point, I guess, I it's great there where there's so much interest in these grants, but I'm also really curious how many grants get completed. <laughs> um, because I feel like that's really where folks are excited about it. And, you know, our grant project, it's more than doubled in costs. I know a couple other cities, they've had to turn them back down because they were scared of, ah, this is going to be too much. It's not going to be able to do it all with the money that I've gotten. So they turned it back. So I think there's a lot of lessons learned around who applies and then who actually gets the projects done as well. Yeah, so we've I'll just be transparent about the numbers. Uh, we've had 15 uh, 
who grantees who are awardees who we made awards to have now declined uh, for those reasons out of 107. Um, I think that's a pretty good success rate for the first round of a program and considering some of the issues that we had uh, just the way it was set up where there wasn't a lot to get through to apply. Uh, that being said, uh, yes, there's going to be issues that folks run into during projects and that number may grow. And obviously there's some, there's a lot of sites amongst uh, folks who are getting to contracts that have dropped off. Uh, I think, you know, the question about costs really comes on seeing how many ports do we want to get, you know, actually installed uh, versus how much does it take to make a successful project? And I don't think that we can place the entire burden of ADA compliance on EV charging projects. Like we're just not gonna be successful installing EV charging if like those projects are gonna be the ones that are responsible for making those upgrades. I think we need to make stations as, as accessible as possible, but you know, there does need to be some sort of reasonable flexibility worked in there. And, you know, I don't have very uh, built out thoughts on exactly what that means in specifics. It's not my area of expertise, and I would look to those who have it to provide us recommendations on um, where, in which cases we should be providing extra funding so that we can be making sure that people with disabilities have access to being able to charge. All right, thank you, Stephen. That was a great presentation. I know there's a lot of really good information in there. Um, I hope you can stick around because as we broaden the conversation, I'm sure there are gonna be more questions that will funnel your way. Um, we're gonna put up our, our last poll and I realize it's probably a slightly unfair question, but we're gonna ask it anyway. Uh, wait for Alexa to pull that up. So you've heard two great presentations. There's a lot of information there. Uh, we're hoping that after today's session, you feel a little bit more confident than when you walked in the room about transitioning your public EV charging structure from planning to implementation. So you're either feeling confident, the resources are helpful, but you need a little bit more. Um, and I can't actually see, let's see, what is the last one? Uh, but you're still, or uh, good resources, but there's still more that needs to happen. Go oh, number two. I applaud the two respondents who are really feeling very confident. Okay, so this is really helpful. And I think, um, Alexa, if you will go ahead and share those results, that'd be great. This is super helpful. I know information for uh, PSRC and the Clean Air Agency. And so now we just want to really open it up more broadly. And I think, and Jennifer, feel free. I know you're going to close us out once we get to the end of the session, but feel free to, to join and provide any color commentary as we open it up to other questions. But essentially we are, it's kind of been touched on a little bit about, you know, how can our two agencies continue to help um, Interestingly enough, there have been a lot of uh, recent conversations at the PSRC's boards and committee tables about this very topic. And one of the comments that um, we've heard has been around roles and responsibilities, um, you know, whether or not there's this regional role. But I guess we want to hear from you kind of a couple of things. Maybe I'll just pr I'll prime the pump here. Um, what gaps based on the great information that's out there, and I'm sure you need to spend more time as I do really digging into both of those. What gaps do you still perceive in uh, moving your EV infrastructure plans forward? And what is the, what are some of the, your biggest challenges to doing so? So Jennifer, is there anything you want to add before we see if hands start popping up? Nope. Okay. All right. I'm going to turn you loose. What can you tell us about, um, Yeah, well, and Alexa, maybe just kind of quickly go through those two. Um, what gaps in information and resources do you still have? And then the next one is, what are some of your biggest challenges? And it could be financial, it could be just staff capacity and resources, it could be, we know that it, um, site selection and uh, issues with, with um, right of way has been mentioned as a big challenge, grid capacity, workforce, all sorts of things. So. That's my prime. So Alexa, thank you for that. If you would go ahead and take that down and Eileen, take it away. Thank you for all the great information. I think it's been very, very helpful. I think um, I think there's 
I agree with Ross. I think some better guidance on a regional level and maybe regional scale would be helpful. But I also wonder about roles. You know, I feel like um, the gatekeepers are the utilities, um, you know, for providing the energy uh, for EV charging. And, and it seems like maybe the focus and maybe they should be driving the bus on this a little bit more. Um, you know, where the counties can have, you know, their properties, their county properties, to, you know, to try to have an EV plan for, for that, both public facing and internal for their fleets. However, when it comes for anything greater than that, you know, I feel like that's where the utilities would, would be driving the bus a little bit more than I think that role and responsibility should be more with the utilities reside with them rather than the county. We can do the permitting or maybe Al and I can do the permitting. Um, but in terms of site selection, they're, they're best to do that. And they have good relationships with a lot of the EV charging providers as well. So maybe that's a better um, avenue uh, and it kind of lifts the burden off of us to kind of scramble for, um, to, to try to like rein in the utilities and try to have that dialogue and try to get a playbook going where then that responsibility, you cut that middleman out and then you give, you give that responsibility and funding, right, to the utilities. It's just an idea. Thanks, I mean, that's, that's a very interesting comment. Other, other initial thoughts that anyone, uh, Michael, go ahead. Hi, good to see you. It's been quite a while. Yeah. Um, I'd say, you know, in that list, most all of the above would be impediments for, for small outfits like us, I suspect. Um, I know we're, we're well beyond overstretched um, already. There's all kinds of stuff I would love to be able to do. I'd like to be able to go after brick grants and apply for other stuff, but we are so, so behind and just trying to accomplish what we're supposed to be doing now. And even pretty far, we're stretching pretty hard to even meet deadlines on comprehensive plans and stuff like that as we try to, to get through the GMA process. Um, man, we just don't have it. I've, I've had multiple uh, contractors, or not contractors, but those the, the marketing folks call me and say, hey, we'd love to help you with EV grants and get you going on all this stuff. I'm like, I don't even have time to talk to you to even get help, <laughs> you know? So... So I'd say that's a big part of our of our locals' issues. I, I suspect there that I'm not alone in that. Thank you, Michael. Very, very, uh, very good point. Perry, uh, go I'm ahead. Not to be too pessimistic, oh, you know. We'd, we'd love to. But. <laughs> no, it's a, it's it's. We hear that in a lot of different forms on a lot of different topics. So it's it's always um, uh, always resonates well in the room. Thanks, Michael. I guess my thoughts fairly well direct to the last two commenters in the sense that. Washington State has a, both a very decentralized electric utility system and a relatively decentralized um, re permit requirement system in terms of the number of jurisdictions that have to administer these types of projects. And so one of my biggest concerns is I, I think that there was suggested in the strategy of a model design standards and model codes and ordinances. I think those are really strong recommendations relative to getting the information and, and tools that need to be adopted by these local jurisdictions to be able to accomplish some of this work. Um, I, like I've, you just heard, there's just no capacity in any of these uh, entities. So they can't write their own codes, if, uh, not efficiently. And I, we've seen this in other things that relate to um, renewable energy and energy efficiency, um, uh, even PACER, like as an example. There's there's tools that the state can provide to, to streamline the process for the, the municipal organizations. To the point about Ellen made about uh, utilities, um, I, I do agree that uh, the large private utilities, that's a natural fit for them to be playing a, a lead role, especially um, with the requirements around uh, improving their power um, carbon. Uh oh, Perry, we lost you a little bit. They're, they're, they're not going to be as much of a willing player, nor do they have a uh, as much the smaller jur jurisdiction, smaller utilities that the city of utilities aren't necessarily going to have those relationships. Thanks, Perry. Uh, Eurydice. Yeah, so uh, just speaking super frankly, like, I mean, there's a 
there's a need for public EV charging infrastructure in Pierce County, and there is political will at some levels of county government for there to be um, for my jurisdiction to deploy public charging, and it's not consistent at all levels. So I see that there's real value in regional collaboration because that's something that has a, a it's easier for us to participate in. I mean, staff capacity is a problem, internal capacity, but um, taking part in a, in a regional uh, collaboration, some kind of plan where we have a clear direction, that is a much easier sell to make this happen for us, if that makes sense. It does, and that's a, that's a really helpful comment. Other initial thoughts or, or comments? It's one of the things that I've been um, been coming to my mind more, not not just the roles and responsibilities related to kind of us as organizations, but the um, and Stephen, you touched on it with the assumption or or, or the um, targets for residential and the parameters for residential charging versus public charging. But then within the public charging available publicly available charging the role of a jurisdiction versus a private company. We've been getting more questions about that and um, that's a bit of a tongue twister for me. So I think that's definitely something we'll be interested in, in learning more from all of you on. Any other thoughts or comments or questions before I put Jennifer on the spot to close us out and talk about what we're gonna, oh good, Kristen, go for it. Yeah, you know, we can get these chargers in the ground, but if the cores get cut, and so like that is so major and like we all shouldn't be trying to figure that out individually. Thanks, Kristen. Perry? Oh, Steven's still in the room. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I still think there's a lot of um, opportunity for state leadership in, in some of these areas and uh, uh, I'll probably reach out to him afterwards with some more, more specifics, but I just think that some of the things he touched on that, that that's that hasn't been funded yet, that was identified in the strategy process, that's something that needs to be re revisited. And I where I think about in the right of way, I think from an economic opportunity, a prosperity of the community perspective, that's a lot of land that the that that, that, that the municipalities manage and own. There's a lot of potential competing um uh, for that right of way, but there's also a great potential to be able to utilize that. In, in potentially in a relationship to a public partner private partnership where a lot of chargers can happen with a particular manufacturer in in, their, in a private public partnership and you see those in other parts of the country so if there's models out there the state can pull it in and start looking at how to uh make recommendations for that type of an approach i think that might be uh, motivation but it, the the public sector from the land use has to do some heavy lifting to make that real Great, thank you, Perry. All right, Jennifer, take us away to talk about uh, what comes next. Yes, thanks all for being here today. This was a good start to the conversation. Thank you, Stephen and uh, Kaylin for great presentations and for all the folks who put effort into creating those resources. So next steps, you will be getting a survey from us. We're gonna send it out to everybody who registered for this event. We're gonna send it out to our full email list. Um, keep the feedback coming. The Puget Sound Clean Air Agency and PSRC are gonna get back together. Take your feedback, understand what you need, how we can help fill the gaps. And you can also go to pugetsoundrevrev.org and you can find a contact form there or you can find an email address there if you want to just get in touch Outside the survey, happy to chat with you and learn more about what your needs are and how we can help fill the gaps. So watch for that coming soon. And I think that is it for now. All right, well, we'll give you uh, four minutes of your lives back. Thanks everyone for giving us your time. Stephen, thanks again for joining us. It was really, really helpful. I'm sure um, our hooks are in you now, so you're not getting away from us. We'll, we'll be back in touch, I'm sure. Always. Thanks, everybody. Clean air folks, do you want to stick around for a few minutes? <laughs>